Welcome back. So now we're going to get into some of the um, disorders you see when homeostasis goes wrong, but particularly those relating to food metabolism. And we'll also discuss some aspects of food metabolism that we haven't discussed yet. So what happens when the body either stops producing insulin or loses its sensitivity to it? The answer is diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, also known as juvenile diabetes, the pancreas stops producing insulin. In type 2 diabetes, which usually is manifest during adulthood, the diabetes is caused either by a decrease in sensitivity to insulin or a decreased production of insulin. It is often, but not always, secondary to being overweight. Some signs of diabetes are frequent urination, um, increased thirst, and increased hun hunger. People with untreated diabetes will often um, eat a great deal and still lose weight because the body cannot make efficient use of the food. It can't actually, you know, utilize that um, the glucose that's coming into the body with the food. However, you know, this isn't a good thing because it often leads to tissue damage. So untreated diabetes is a very dangerous thing. So this leads to another question, which is a very important question, and one that, honestly, I don't know that we fully know the answer to. How do we know when we're hungry, and how do we know when we're full? So again, in truth, we really don't fully know how this works. Um, and that's why we don't have a miracle drug that stops hunger that can be used for weight loss. However, what we do know are some of the factors that play a role. Some have thought that insulin levels may serve as a signal of satiation. Indeed, lowering insulin levels in animals causes them to be hungry, and giving a moderate dose of insulin results in the animal eating less. So to follow up on this investigation, um, researchers tried to give a large dose of insulin, and lo and behold, it led animals to eat more, not less, which is the opposite of what you would think. So what could explain this curious finding? The answer is that it takes more than just insulin to influence whether or not we are hungry. By giving a large dose of insulin, it directed the glucose in the bloodstream into storage, leading to low blood sugar. Thus, low levels of glucose also appear to affect hunger and satiation. While glucose and insulin levels are a start at understanding satiation and hunger, they truly are just a start. They do not explain it completely, and thus a large amount of research has been done looking into this question. As we mentioned, feeding behavior is complex in part because it must meet very complex requirements for the body. Thus, no one brain region has control of appetite, but like many of the other homeostatic systems, the thalamus does play an important role in regulating the me metabolic rate, f food intake, and also body weight. The dual center hypothesis, which actually is an outdated hypothesis, but still important to discuss, um, proposed that there may be two centers within the hypothalamus that are responsible for both hunger and sati satiation. There was some support for this theory, as the ventromedial hypothalamus, when removed, would lead to obesity, whereas the lateral hypothalamus was linked with a refusal to eat when removed. So that that looks pretty good. Um, however, once again, it didn't up telling the whole story. For the ventromedial hypothalamus, it would lead to obesity, but the animal would eventually stop eating and would settle into a new normal weight that was higher than the original weight. Similarly, with the lateral hypothalamus, animals that were kept alive for a while with a feeding tube would eventually go back to eating and eventually would find a new lower normal weight. So thus, these centers appear important, but again, they don't tell the full story with satiation and hunger. So this is just an exam example of um, when you remove the VMH, you have this quick increase in weight, but then you get to a point where you're pretty static. You just have a new normal weight, and if you're force feeding, the person, you know, the animal will gain weight, but as soon as you stop feeding, again, it goes back to this new normal. Or if you deprive the animal of food, it will lose weight, 
and then in recovery we'll go back to the new normal. So it looks like with removing the VMH, it just results in a new higher normal uh, normal weight. So we know that the dual center hypothesis doesn't explain hunger, at least doesn't fully explain it. So what does? More recent research has looked at the arcuate nucleus, which is part of the hypothalamus and may hold some of the answers. It is thought that this area of the hypothalamus acts on highly sensitized appetite control um, centers based upon circulating levels of several different hormones. These hormones include insulin, leptin, ghrelin, and peptide YY, also known as PYY. So what are these hormones and how are they related? So mice who have two copies of what is called the obese gene, which is a gene that codes for leptin, end up being obese. Leptin is a hormone that is released by fat cells and can be used by the body to ensure that the animal is at a proper weight um, as higher levels of leptin suppress hunger. So higher leptin, less hunger. However, deficits in this gene result in problems with leptin production and sensitivity, resulting in the switch not being turned off. So the animal will become obese because there's not that switch off. Thus, leptin appears to be the body's way of monitoring and controlling its body fat percentage. Ghrelin, which is um, named for its use in stimulating the release of growth hormone, so that's actually where the name comes from. GH is from growth hormone, REL is releasing, so ghrelin, uh, GH releasing hormone, is also a powerful appetite stimulant. Which makes sense, you know, when you have growth, you probably want, you know, an increase in appetite in order to fuel that growth. It is released by the endocrine cells in the stomach. Levels of ghrelin increase while fasting and fall after a meal is eaten. Well, except for those who are obese, in which case the levels remain persistently high, which might help explain why people who are obese um, have larger appetites than those who do not. So again, this is just another piece in that puzzle. Lastly, we have PYY, which is secreted by the cells of the small and large intestine. It is at low levels before eating a meal, but the levels increase quickly after ingesting. Further, injections of PYY in both humans and rats lead to a curbed appetite. As such, it's thought that PYY may work in opposition to ghrelin and act as a suppressant um, of appetite. It is also part of the reason why it takes a little while after we start eating to feel satiated, as it takes the food a while to get down to the intestines, and that's what causes PYY to be released. So the current model of appetite focuses on the um, arcuate appetite controller that we discussed in the hypothalamus. As you will remember, we mentioned previously that this controller uses levels of several different hormones in order to control appetite. The way it appears to do this is through two different types of neurons with opposing functions. One set of neurons produces NPY and AGRP, both of which stimulate appetite and lower metabolism, and these lead to weight gain. The other set of neurons produce PMC and CART, which inhibit appetite and increase metabolism, leading to weight loss. Now, how do these hormones affect these systems? For leptin, both neurons have receptors for leptin, but they affect, they're affected differently. Leptin activates the POMP CART, so the POMC um, CART uh, receptors, and this causes um, inhibition of, um, sorry, so leptin activates the pump card system and it inhibits the NPY AGRP system. Ghrelin works the same way as leptin, but it's a shorter term, it doesn't act as long. Further, as is expected, um, since it's the opposite of ghrelin, PY wor PYY works in the opposite way. 
So thus, our current belief is that um, this area of the hypothalamus is how all these hormones get accounted for in hunger. However, there's much more that we don't know about this, and if there's one thing I know, it's that by the time I teach your children, I suspect most of this will have changed. It's a rapidly changing area. Although it seems that this should be simple, obesity is extremely challenging uh, to treat and um, as a lot of our evolutionary adaptations are working against the weight loss, it's really challenging for those of us who are obese who are trying to lose weight. Uh, for instance, as mentioned earlier, when we reduce the number of calories we eat, we also see that our body adapts itself so that it uses fewer calories. This is why so many of us, myself included, struggle mightily with dieting, since it's a ton of work with little payoff. So what can be done? What works and what doesn't work? Certain drugs have been designed to reduce appetite and have been tried, but we haven't found a winner yet. For instance, a cannabinoid antagonist was thought to possibly help. We know that marijuana can give you a case of the munchies, so it's thought that its antagonist can cause the anti-munchies. This does occur, which is great, but also produces an anti-high, which causes significant mood problems and thus it's not an ideal solution. Drugs targeting leptin um, also have not been overly successful. There are a few drugs that have been tested, um, a few new drugs, such as a PYY nasal spray, and only time will tell whether or not those help. One thought has been why not just go in and remove the fat, like we do for liposuction. Unfortunately, animal research has shown that the, if body fat is surgically removed, the animals will eat until they regain the same amount of fat, fat with remarkable precision. So with this, we actually often see with liposuction the same thing, that that fat comes back um, after surgery, unless it's not really an ideal solution. We have also tried to increase metabolism through affecting thyroid hormones, but unfortunately it results in undesirable side effects, such as dangerously increased heart rate, which is not a good thing. There's also a new method of trying to inhibit the accumulation of fat by preventing its development of new blood vessels that are needed to store the fat. Testing is still early on, but if successful, this may lead to a new way to reduce the accumulation of fat in the body. There are also a few medications, such as Xenical, that are approved to prevent the digestion of fat so it just passes through the body. However, it has only resulted in modest, modest weight loss, and it often causes intestinal discomfort, so it may not be worth the risk-reward profile. Surgery has also been used to reduce weight. This is done in many different ways, from reducing the size of the stomach to putting a band around the stomach. Long-term studies have been quite positive, including long-term loss of weight, recovery from diabetes, and reduced mortality. However, some of the results are mixed. Um, a VA study, VA being a veterans hospital study, showed no increase in mortality for older adults when compared with usual care. Thus, the question of whether or not it helps you live longer is still up in the air. While these results are significant, so also are the complications. A study of insurance claims showed that 22% of patients developed complications during their initial hospital stay, and 40% developed complications in the first six months. You can tell um, that to Charlie Weiss, this guy here, um, the former coach at Notre Dame and current coach at Kansas, who nearly died of complications from bariatric surgery. Thus, the results can be life-changing, but far from a no-brainer. There are also a couple eating disorders that are life-threatening on the other side of the spectrum. So with anorexia, you have a person who's at or below, um, well, below 85% of the normal body weight. So someone who's extremely um, deprived. And this is often, um, often paired up with a Ir, not irrational, but a 
introverted view of oneself. So individuals who are anorexic will truly see themselves as being fatter than they are, and that really drives the disease in a lot of ways. There's also bulimia, which is marked by periodic gorging and then purging either by vomiting, laxatives, and actually it can be purging by um, excessive exercise as well. And then binge eating. Binge eating is gorging with more food than is necessary to satisfy hunger, but without the purging that you'd see in bulimia. So you see eating disorders on both sides, either you know eating too much or um, not eating enough, and either way it leads to uh, serious health complications.